And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today we're here with the great Mike Faddock. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I think we got to give a shout out first to your dad. It's his 80th birthday, right? It was yesterday, yeah. Big day. The great yeah. Bob Saddock. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's, uh, it was a big day. We had a party on Saturday, brought some family up. We have a cabin where I live. Um, our family has a cabin across the river. So uh, we brought some cousins and aunts and uncles up. Not a whole lot of people, but just because of everything that's going on. But they uh, they all came up and had a nice day. My dad did a good job. So he uh, enjoyed it. He's the oldest living Zadok ever. Or not old. I mean, he's the oldest ever Zadok. Wow. So he had the longevity was... That. His his parents died at a young age and and stuff. So it's a good. He's like the pioneer. Get us through the eighties. Right, that's <laughs> it. Too. So yeah, <laughs> I think right. that's I think that's somewhere in the Bible where it says about being the the strong man lives to be eighty or something like that yeah, in the yeah. Psalms, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Does he still have the Midlands jacket you gave him? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He actually wears that in the winter. Does he? No joke. My dad wears that jacket. Yeah. Doesn't wear it a lot, but every winter when it, he, as he's gotten older, he's always cold. He's always chilled. Yeah. But he'll pull out this old maroon Midlands coat. I'm like you wear that thing, like it's crazy. But he does. He likes it. It's, it's which is nice, you know. It's he yeah, kind of he gets the rewards of his uh, the fruits of his labor, so to speak. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Man, we we watched it. I got to say, me and my brothers, we watched that that Iowa documentary and what like you, you, your attitude, your mindset that left, that left such a lasting impression on me and both of my younger brothers. And we were watching that since we were kids. What, what year was that? Oh, one or Oh two. Yeah. The same. Yeah. Oh one. They filmed from Oh one to Oh two. That was a Oh two. Oh one. Oh two season. Yeah. So that was going into, that was my senior year of high school. It was your senior year of college, my senior yeah. year of high school. My yeah. brothers, my brothers were young at the time, and we probably watched it hundreds of times. But man, everything it, right down to when we started our business originally, we were called Z Fanatical Fitness. I know you guys sent us a message to make, like, say, "Is this okay?" Like you just, it was cool. It was, I remember you sent us out a message, Bill and I both, and because <laughs> well, our camp shirts were always Zadix Fanatics, and is this too yes. close? And just so you know, we were doing it. It was. I just thought it was a, a good respectful gestures people do you know we wanted to let you know because i remember the big thing that always stuck out in my head the word fanatical was pretty much all over everything when brand said you know pick him up once and throw him down did he always call you that was that your nickname uh no what was, no. What was the story with that that the fanatic yeah um one year we were down and it was when byu was down to their last their last they're dropping their program that year in Iowa went out to Utah to duel them and kind of, I don't know, bring spark and interest to a, a meet. And when we went out there, they had, uh, their announcer created funny names. So like at 125, they sent out, we had Jody strip matter yeah. and they called them from Iowa at 125 pounds. The little general, Jody Strip Matter. So we all started laughing. And then Eric Jurgens was next. And he had a funny name. But I was automatic Mike Zadick. And it's that kind of stuck with it. And we're all talking about like our camp t-shirts were Zadick's fanatics every year. So awesome. it all got pushed together. The automatic fanatic Mike Zadick. And because we just kept cheesing it out a little bit because... I think TJ Williams was next and he had like lightning bolt and it had a rhyme to everybody, but we're all just getting ready for this dual meet. And we just start giggling about the nicknames they gave every one of us. It was kind of funny. That's, that's <laughs> great. And I always remember them saying that uh, Gable always spoke about that saying that they always considered him a fanatic. So when I heard yeah, that, very. so hearing Gable say that, hearing them, hearing Brand say that about you, I said fanatical. I'm like, I love it. So that really stuck with us. Yeah. It is. My dad's always kind of been labeled that. <coughs> yeah. He had a, <coughs> our wrestling camps. Obviously, you've seen the shirts in the past. And, um, Zach's Fanatics camp was what his camp was every year. And my dad literally, everybody that's ever met him, um, 
knows that about him. We've had. <clears throat> Let me get a drink quick. Go ahead, go grab some water. Snacking on a couple pecans. I I just had some almonds myself. I'm a little bit dry, also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got some coffee choking down, right? <laughs> 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 get it to go down. <coughs> It'll make it eventually, but no, uh, yeah, like just everybody had come out to camp. Some of the great wrestling coaches throughout the world. My dad, he'd stay up and keep him up like one, two in the morning, just sitting there talking wrestling, and <coughs> it's pretty, pretty awesome seeing that in my throughout his life because uh, you know he's obviously that who pushed and drove Bill and I with the, with the support of mom and the whole family really. But he was, <clears throat> he's the epitome of fanatical and you can't help but not be that way and see it now that you're grown up and kind of gone through his system. But the guy is, uh, I think back in the day he was mis misunderstood because his, because of his passion. Um, from a lot of parents that essentially want their kids to sign up to play something. My dad was, I mean, when we were five years old, you're going to win the Olympics. You're going to win the worlds. And that's what he told us. And we believed it and we thought about it. And, you know, I remember I was five years old. I've told the story a million times, but it, it's an impactful story is dad. Bill was obviously five and a half years older than me. So, Bill started out and he was just rocking and rolling. He was good. Bill was winning big tournaments nationally at a young age. I think by the time he got to college, he only lost five or eight times in his entire life. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's like at grade school wrestling on up. So he was like, he was pretty good. And at that time, dad was trying to get everybody he could around his sons to impact their future. And he brought in Randy Lewis in 84, 85, like right after he won the Olympics. And we were in L.A. watching it. And I remember thinking, wow, this guy's an Olympic gold medalist. I, I remember certain things. Like he didn't have a peck. I was six years old at the time. He didn't have a peck. He won the Olympics. And he wore brutes. And I got my brute shoes signed. So then I was already on my way to become an Olympic champ because he was an Olympic champ. And I wore brutes, too. And. It's just a, the things that you take away from it and gut wrench. He showed us a gut wrench lock, the Randy Lewis grip and things that really impact you. And uh, i tell you what, it was all from my dad reaching out and using every resource as a fanatic of the sport to get every edge he could for his, you know, for his boys and his, and his, his team. He had a club too. So. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, a, cool. it's a shame that gets a negative connotation, the word, because fanatic just means you have a drive. You have that drive and that intensity. That's all it means to me anyway. Yeah, it's, you know, there's some cliche lines out there. I just actually read the other day about doing what most people think is impossible and kind of leading your own path in life and, and how, how most people think, oh, you're crazy because you do that. Well, no, it's your, you focus on something and you're passionate about it. Um, and you do everything in your power in the, the, the right ways to accomplish it. And that's just, that's a lot of things people maybe veer from a little bit because it might seem crazy to you, but to me, it's, that's normal for you not to think like I'm thinking. I think, uh, you're crazy. I think you're the crazy one, you know? So it's, it's interesting. No, it makes it, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. A lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people that way. What's that? I said a lot of people that way, you know, though. You know, it's just um how 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 you're wired. And I think people are starting to see it more and more. I've actually I, to me personally I see a change in like um some of the training we used to do growing up and like especially at Iowa and why Gable was so successful um in those years you look at I mean a lot of things go into it, but I think probably in the 80s, 90s, his teams just outworked everybody. They outworked everybody because he was fanatical about making his guys so conditioned and so strong. But they were good, great wrestlers also, right? But at the same time, it's 
a lot of matches, how do Iowa get their Iowa style? Uh, how how they get that? How do they get branded? Well, what they do? They always beat people in the second, third periods and broke them. Right. Well, conditioning, 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 and and now you see other teams now evolved and done that. So now it's um, it's trickled into the fitness world. You see all these things on, you know, I catch them on Twitter and these things about a guy's. Now you got kids. I don't know what that stuff's called when you jump and flip over like from one building to another. Oh, parkour. Okay, parkour. Stuff like that. And then all the tough, I don't know what all the stuff is. What's the fitness stuff people are doing? Those tough mutters and Spartan races and yeah, and all that kind of stuff. That. Yeah. I mean, back in the days, probably when I was a kid, people were like, that's crazy. What are you guys doing? You know, you go to the gym and you have a brace and you do this and you do this. But now it's like expanding to where I think people are getting more. They're seeing what drives you to uh, to a challenge and they're feeding off it. Like it's it's like a drug. You want you want to do more, but it's actually a good thing to have. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. If that makes sense, but you no, it makes sense. And you and you said you you and your brother were a little bit different. You said he came in, he had that success right away. Yeah, and yeah. So Bill was, was yeah. Like uh, when Dad started in with wrestling, Bill was a real hyper, hyper, go get him. He went on the mat and just fed off Dad. And my dad was very intense, hollering when he hollered. It was a big, loud, deep bark, and um, he fired Bill up. And Bill got out on the mat and he he just one kids and was good you yeah. know i i got through going into the wrestling at five six seven eight nine ten years old and i was soft and timid and quiet and just i didn't you know i didn't get it, the competitiveness figured out my dad would drive nuts because i could go out and i could get beat and i would just do the complete opposite i would just be like eh just be calm. And my dad didn't like the fact that I didn't show emotion after losing and it would drive him nuts. Well, I didn't want to show any because then he would show it and it would amplify. And then I'm like, <laughs> I didn't like it. Yeah. So a lot of it was just from watching my brother, um, seeing the higher level of wrestling and knowing what it took. Cause I eventually, um, developed competitiveness and then it kind of took off. Like I, I then after that I wanted to win and it was just kind of a late bloomer. Thing. Yeah. But and that's like a lot of kids I think is important with parents and and kids, especially that I see throughout the country and I see a lot of people post about it and I've seen it at my own and at tournaments and it's just these kids that are five to twelve years old learn wrestling and enjoy the sport. Um I was in it at five years old, right? I wasn't, I was doing good things, but it's not like I was this kid just killing everybody and big deal. I was learning though. I learned technique. I, I absorbed really good technique and moves and had the best of the best people around me. And eventually you develop that where you take off in your own brain, um, you know, internally and then go out and compete. And I think you see so many crazy parents like Rah! about their kids. And you know what? If your kid's going to be good, you give him the resources to expose him to all these great things. Let his brain develop his own strategy and technique and drive to the sport. And at then at that age, it'll sink in. If you put him in the, you know, if you put him in those, uh, give him those opportunities. but. You see a lot of people like seven year olds coming off the mat. And it's just like, holy smokes, people. Like, yeah. You know, I always think about that. I think about you want the kid, everyone starts falling in love with the sport at a different age, if they fall in love with it at all, which exactly. you can't guarantee. Yep. And then I also think, is there a way to expedite the process of not necessarily passion? I mean, of course, you could fan the fire a little bit, but how do, you, how do people flip the switch where now they get more? Not necessarily angry after a loss, but they're more of a go-getter. Maybe they normally hang back a little bit, but now they pull the trigger on their moves. They get after it. They don't take that. They don't wait for the other kid and, and feel them out. They impose yeah. their will. So I always yeah. think, 
How do you respect both of those? Let them develop organically, but at the same time being able to flip those switches. Was there anything like that that happened with you? Yeah, there was. You know, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I think about seventh, eighth grade, I just... Um, Dad exposed us to a lot of things, like I said. So when I was being exposed to these things, there were certain things that would fire me up. I can yeah. remember the old, the Iowa video, um, Competitor Supreme. You ever yep. watch that? <laughs> that, that, that was like a turning point to me. <laughs> I watched that movie, uh, that show all the time. And I was like, these guys are like mean, tough. <laughs> and I thought about seventh grade, I started getting to where I was, you know, even sixth grade, you become a good wrestler in school and then you, you got a, you got a little street cred going for yourself. So you got to make sure you can back it up. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, I started thinking I was getting tough and then I was like, well, I can't just think it. I'm going to have to start like backing it up and I'm about ready to hit high school. And my brother was a four time state champion and that was such a big deal. And I'm like, I'm, I haven't won a freestyle state tournament yet, <laughs> so you better get your butt in gear. And it was kind of that, you know, self-talk and development that you, okay, let's, let's get it going. So I had a good friend a couple years older than me. That was a, his dad was a family friend of ours, coached with my dad in the club and uh, the youngs. And Jabby took me out running, and I hated to run. And pick, he picked me up one day, and I was young at the time like sixth grade, maybe even younger, but it kind of developed over that. But the very first time he's like, Hey, we're going to the carnival. I was like, awesome. Like Jabby's coming to pick me up. He had a red Celica Toyota and it was a cool little sports car. And I got up early in the morning and he had to come get me at like six 30. And I was like, we're going to the carnival. And I got up and I was ready to go. And he goes, Oh, Garrett, grab, grab those tennis shoes. You got to make sure you have tennis shoes. I was like, okay. Well, he takes me down along the river on this trail. And the carnival was him and I going for a run. And we ran. I don't know how far we ran. It was three <laughs> miles. But here I am, not good at running, didn't enjoy it. He was He's a runner. He ran a lot of marathons, very successful. He still does at 70s. But he taught me technique on how to run. He made it fun. He made it enjoyable. So once what I thought was just misery became something now I can – Outside of my joints aching now, I love to just, at midnight, I'll go throw my stuff on to this day and just, it's quiet and the world is asleep. I just go for a run and it's enjoyable. So that was a turning point for me as far as my personal drive and like, okay, this isn't work. This is actually what it's going to take, these type of things. My conditioning, I was in strength training. So I enjoyed strength training. I had a great coach there that inspired me and drove me and pushed me. And then obviously with wrestling, my dad, um, I got him. That's exactly when it clicked to me. Like this guy's not a nut. He's not, he's trying to, trying to get that emotion out of me because you need to compete with emotion. You can't, I mean, whether you show it or not inside of you is it's bubbling. I mean, it's like, it's a lot of energy coming to the surface of the skin. And I think I was just kind of like a, that facial expression, my body language, all, all of it was probably, I look back, I feel bad. My dad should have kicked me in the butt more than he did. But <laughs> knowing how I am and like seeing it, I'm like, yeah. But that's, that's I think, uh, when things click, the learning how to run, uh, already lifting and seeing where that is. And then the intensity of my dad, I, I knew what I needed to do to pick up my, my training and my drive. So a lot of it is, I think with all that said, it's being around the, the people, the right people. You know, I, I think uh, there's a very important line with coaching and it's not about being all bah, in somebody's face. I mean, I see that a lot. And there's a time when you need to come down on somebody when they're out doing some crazy stuff. And that's when you do it. But you don't yell at somebody for trying something and failing you know what I mean and I think a lot of coaches like I know I was talking to a kid a couple of weeks ago I was at a branding or a week ago at a, a branding and he was talking about his college coach he kept hitting this move on him 
trying and he was wrestling and the coach kind of kept choking him out and tell him it's not going to work. Don't do it. And that kind of stuff is little, but it drives me nuts. Like I'm thinking, okay, what were you doing? I, I actually asked him, the guy's 40 years old now, 30 some years old. So what were you doing? He's a, uh, well, I did this. And I was like, why would he just grab you and choke you out and tell you after you did it like three times, it was like, it's just never going to work in college. Like actually to me, the difference is as a good coach, um, that's a natural motion for you. It's a natural, mo natural movement. Um, maybe you don't as a coach do it, but figure out and develop that athlete because it's natural. He's going to be successful at it. Um, you can do it. You just got to coach him and teach him how to develop it to where he's going to be in a very successful state with it. And I think it's fine lines with, with that kind of stuff, you know, that kind of yeah. development coaching. That, that makes a lot of sense. It sounds like they're physically and mentally or technically and mentally. It's very similar. Like there are some principles technically that have to be there. And that's what the coach would give them. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's what that coach would give them those technical um, pieces of the foundation, but then those little nuances within there that work for, for just him, you'd want to cultivate that kind of like mindset. Yeah, sure. We have a mindset program that's standardized. There's yeah. principles, but like you said, you and your brother being totally different, me and my brother being totally different. You yeah. couldn't treat me before a match the same way you treated my brother, Jeff. Exactly. Yep. Frank. So yep. Yeah, talk, talk about that a little bit, about having those principles in line, but at the same time, each person's a little different, both, I guess, technically and also mentally. Like, what did you have to tell yourself before matches to get yourself in an optimal mindset, and how might that have been maybe different than Bill? Um, Bill, you know, I can't really speak for him, um, just because our age was so far apart. Or even your um, athletes, whoever. But, but, like, with me, personally, I can give you great examples throughout my life um, that helped me that I took with me, um, as a coach and high school was one thing. And it, it, yes, it's high school and it's a little different than senior level or college. But I think one thing for me, high school, my coaches were very confident in me and I had lost one time in my whole career. So I had all the reasons to be confident, but I still took every match very seriously. But my coaches, they were really relaxed. And they were just like, I like to chew gum a lot when I was young and or have a toothpick in my mouth. And I, my coaches would be like, I'm getting ready to step on the mat. My coach would lean back and say, hey, you want to stick gum? And it just made me laugh because here I'm supposed to be like going into war. And he's like, relax. And I'm like, yeah, I do actually. And I take a stick of gum and it relaxed me and calmed me. and. I could step out there and just have a clear mind. Um, I think as I got as I got older, especially in college, it was kind of a ah mentality, and it goes back to when I was young with my dad. He was that way, and I I and Bill responded well at a young age with that. I didn't so well. Um, I think I probably I needed calm happy-go-lucky um, people around me. And that way, if it was all calm and happy-go-lucky, when I stepped on the mat, I would go, rah. You know, that was me. It was like a Superman-type transition for me. I would be, like, really good, and then I could go out and pull off my... Sorry. Makes sense. No problem. I could go out and, you know, flex your muscle, so to speak. So I, I think uh, having the, <clears throat> the corner know, knowing your athlete, um, knowing what they need. Me personally, when I got older, it was it was kind of realize it's that's what I need. I don't need like guys walking by me like super intense. Say, hey, relax. Like, this is no big. This is no just another day at the office. And uh, you know it was really uh, calming. And there's moments I had that in my senior level, and and then there's moments I didn't and. Um, I could definitely tell you where I responded better and how I wrestled better. And with me personally, I like to keep as a coach, I'm really excited and hyper for my athletes when I coached and um, they know it, I could be in the trenches with them and they know that. And, um, I think I've had 
a really good bond with them. So when they step on the mat, there's some that they want to get slapped and they want to tell them, you know, they're on top of the world and you're going to go in there and crush this. You know, I used to tell them a lot. Some of these guys would say, hey, we're going to walk into this tournament. We're going to pick up the damn building and smash it to the ground. And I'm going to bring the gas and we're going to burn the whole freaking place and leave with all the hardware. You know, and they just feed off that and they'd go out there and, and, and some guys you just keep it light with them and let them know that what some good things they've been doing throughout the week and throughout the year as far as uh, their consistent training and their development and just a really light mood and uh, reminders of confidence and they step out because you always have that, you know, in your mind and they step out and kind of do their thing. You know, they just, a lot of them weren't just like, ah, you know, so it's being able to read them um, and it's easy to read them once you're, you're invested in them and spend all this time with them. You can't say, oh yeah, he needs to do that because it's a blanket. You know, I've been around a lot of coaches that, well, not a lot, but I've just been around coaches and I see how they do it. And I'm just like, you know, what, it, I mean, what it, it's to each your own, but um, you can't really know unless you're, you're invested in time. You know, it's like, yeah, anything, you know, you got a girl, you don't, you don't really know where it's going to go. Spend some time together, go through some adversities, do some things and, you know, then you build a bond. Right. And I think with athletes, uh, they had all my attention when I was at Virginia tech, especially, um, even when I was at Iowa, I just probably was a little different role at Iowa. It's a little different, but at Virginia tech, it was all in and I had, uh, all the opportunity I wanted to develop and work with kids and the athletes. And you've seen the transition and you've seen the development in their minds and in their wrestling, um, just from the mindset and mentality, I would say that I brought to it. And I've had some, some great letters from some of my former wrestlers after leaving, especially the Iowa state situation and leaving there and just having some really good, and I tell you what, the biggest thing about all the letters that they're the kind of tells the same story is mentality and the morals that brought to the table. And that to me is what, you know, as a coach is what I, I'm, uh, I can sit back and smile and be happy and I'm proud of. And because it, it's all about reaction or their responses are they're not about a tournament or an event it was something that's lifelong lesson to them i will use this when i'm married i will use this in my work i am at work now and i'm using it like that that type of thing that um with that kind of mentality and, and motivation and how you handle them it, it goes a long way so it's that's uh i guess what's been you know rewarding just yeah. Carrying that, carrying that forward with you guys. No, that that makes a ton of sense. I know when we, um, basically, like, hey, you brought up competitor supreme. Going back a few minutes, it's yeah. in, in my with me and my brothers. There's basically three shows that we watched. It was competitor supreme. It was there was a, a Tom and Terry Brands episode that was like a special done on them. It's like an a, like an hour long or something, a biography, whatever. And then there's the Iowa documentary, the season. So all three of those things, like it's, it's all ingrained in the same thing in my mind. And that's actually the reason why we picked the colors black and yellow, because yellow. as, as we are, that's not by mistake. It's yeah. because as, as you said, using wrestling as a vehicle, pretty much for school, your life, your relationships and so on and so forth. For me, the fanatical mindset, that's just how you approach everything, whether it's your faith, your friendships, whatever it is, it's like you, you're all in, or you're not in, <laughs> right? So yeah, that, that is that is really big, and and you can yeah. see that, like that's that's great that your athletes are thanking you for that because that's that's the most important lesson, the life lessons, right? No, it is. It's it's uh, important, and some of them, you know, probably probably didn't uh, resonate well with it, but it's just difference of people. But a lot of them did, and it's funny because it's funny how you can expose them to it, and then they realize. You know, I, I laugh at, I can kind of pick a, I don't know if I need to say names, but a former wrestler at uh, Iowa State, yeah. he's uh, 
he's a ah, he's a good kid. He's funny. He's when we first got there, it was probably to me. I can just say that he it was. I mean, our first day we got in there, it was like we watched them work out and they warmed up for like 10 minutes and drilled for 10 minutes. And then they all sat against, I was like crazy. Like there's no, and, uh, we kind of had to, it's like, uh, I don't know. I have a new puppy dog. I got him in December. You got to be hard in the beginning and then you can back off. You got to kind of set the ground, you know, your ground rules. So going into that program, you couldn't have any bend, a whole lot of bend with, I mean, we didn't go in militant, but we went in to ch- shock that culture and change it because it was a, it was everything that shouldn't have been there, you know, just e- easily, e- easily enough to say. But this one particular kid, um, we kind of got, you know, our ground rules laid throughout weeks and weeks and this is expectation and um, trying to develop a culture that was um, where we want to go as a program. And it's, you know, you don't know where you're going, but it was, you, you were making headway. You could see things. There's good guys in there that were trying to be great. And then the guys that had all this ability that weren't, they were just lazy and still cutting corners. And it's not going to change overnight, but um, you're still going to, you know, stay the course. Well, I don't know how many months into it is we had practice one day and this particular guy, he doesn't show up. And I'm like, Where's he at? I don't know what everyone's saying. Well, he wanted to go to a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert. So he went. That was just like, a, that was just no big deal to him. Like, <laughs> I was just like, that's normal around here, huh? I was like, so I, that just blew my mind. Like, come on, glued. So when I found out and, you know, I probably said, you know, I ripped him up one side and down the other and explained to him, like, you know, this is, you don't just, Oh, hey, Red Hot Chili Peppers is down in Des Moines. I'm going to go to the concert. Uh, Sorry, I didn't tell anybody I'm going. So here's the thing. You know what? Maybe just say, hey, I really want to go to this. Um, What do you think? Have a conversation with me about it. And you don't know me. I might say, yeah, I go. You know? But uh, you don't just not show up to practice. You're on a scholarship and a program that's trying to get better and just I'm going to Red Hot Chili Peppers and make up your home. So we use that as an example. And I was hard on him for a while about it. But it was funny throughout the course of the next four or five months, that same example came up when we're all smiling in front of the whole team in a different light. Because we had made this progress of committing ourselves. And it was literally a mind thing. That's all it was, because back then it was like shock. Everyone's like, this guy's crazy. Why are you screaming? Why are you hollering? What do you mean? Like, and then fast forward six months and everyone's like, wow, like that was, I can't believe you were doing that back then because their minds had changed already and they expected more out of each other. He expected more out of himself. And it literally was just kind of a, it was a, it's a good thing from taking a, an uh, impactful moment where it didn't seem so, it was real cloudy and not a good day as far as, you know, everybody's <laughs> attitude and then take it and use it as an example moving forward and where we can all laugh. And now I could, the time afterwards, I could nudge him seven months later and be like, yeah, or we could just go red hot chili pepper, use it as an example. And then everyone laughs and you get a kick, you know, but no, that's good. But like, like you said, it's it's being in it as a coach, being in it for the long haul, approaching it more as a marathon, not a sprint, because it sounds like this athlete made some pretty strong transformations. Yeah, no, he, he has. And he's he's um, he was young then. He's still competing. And he um, he has. I think he's matured in his mind. He's always been a little crazy, but it's a good crazy. I mean, all these all good wrestlers need that in them. But um it is. It was a very much a, a marathon. It was, it was to me. It was a sprinting marathon, but nonetheless, it was a marathon. It wasn't. So it was like we're gonna run this marathon, but we're sprinting it, and it's like because you know. But I think the higher your expectation, and the the more passion and focus and drive in order to have the change, um, 
the faster it's going to happen. You want to walk into something relaxed and lackadaisical, then it's going to, and you have all the right things in place. It can, it's going to happen, but it might be seven years. I ain't going to wait that long. We're, you know, let's get this. It's really easy. It's really easy. It's right here. It's right here. It's real simple. It's making it up here and then using those thoughts and that drive and putting it into action. And then once you put it into action, it becomes a routine. Makes sense. And yes, you have a choice of eh, maybe not today. Mm, you know what? No, I'm going to do it today. So if you really care, your mind's going to tell you it's not even going to waver. There might be a day where, oh, man, you know, and you kind of want to and you're like, it's just not in the cards for me. I'm not. That's not allowed. It's just not allowed. And I was it's uh, it's, a, I guess, a way that becomes a lifestyle and then these guys realize well this is you know this is our lifestyle this is what's expected of um a high level athlete at a program and the you know and then the kind of the machine starts running itself a little bit and then you just gotta you know fine tune but it's all the development and transition of the mind yeah like so you said it's once, once you form that habit once you form that habit mentally then it becomes a lot easier like you said it becomes autopilot it just takes over and it starts running itself, which is great. Yeah. What did, what did you see was the biggest, for, for most wrestlers that you've seen, what's the biggest mental struggle? I don't know if maybe going back middle school to high school, high school, maybe you want to speak maybe more to high school to college and college to the international. What do you think mentally are the most difficult roadblocks for the athletes to overcome? Um, are they different struggles? Or are they basically the same? I'd say there, there's everyone, you know, everyone. I think, um, I think for college, at that college level is, um, everybody had had a pretty decent amount of success. And um, especially for me in, in high school here, there's some tough matchups I had. And then there was, I knew I was going to, it was just a matter of how fast I was going to pin the guy. I'm going to play a little bit, you know, just, just dip, you know, level change. You know, it's probably different. Like in Pennsylvania, and, and there's a lot of competitive. You know, the fifth place guy in Pennsylvania is pretty dang good. But um, for me, you kind of knew that. I think um, you get to college after being whoever you are. Not saying me personally, but just maybe you're an ASICS All American. If they still have that, you know, and and uh, you were honorable mention or this and that. You get to college, and all of a sudden there's a guy in there that can just rip your head off. And you're like, wait a second. I thought I'm, I'm kind of the man here. I had some success. I was like, uh, you know, whoever it is, like a couple of times state champ. And it's a, it's essentially to me, it was a, a fine tuning of technique and a lot of mental development, knowing you can hang and believing in yourself. You know, I think, a lot of guys go in and they expect that they're not anymore. I think the kids have changed right now. It's these guys, they're confident in themselves. These young 18, 19 year olds, they're transitioning right in. Like back in the day for me, high school was here. And then you had another level at college. And I think I was good enough in high school. My last few years where if I was thinking like, I can just beat anybody. It was like, no, I got to wrestle here. Then I got to develop in college. And then after that, I got to develop at the senior level. And then hopefully I can, you know, my goals, not hopefully, but I'm going to win the Olympics. Well, if I was maybe thinking back, I remember I was going to Iowa, but I was thinking if I don't go to Iowa, I'm just going to go to the Olympic training center. And I should have maybe thought more along that throughout the time. But a lot of kids now, they're at a, successful level in high school and then they get into college and I think they just struggle from maybe the grind of it but once they adapt to the grind of college living when you're on your own you have school requirements you got to take care of and then you have to train um, the way you train in college and that that kind of commitment and study table it's just kind of being able to balance that some guys do it real well some guys don't um, but I think I think it's uh, exposure, and then the mind will 
with the right leadership in mind develops and and that competitiveness and drive goes through. It's just kind of a little bit about bearings and putting it all together. Okay, this is how I do it here. And then boom. And then the same drive and competitiveness you had at any level at a kid or high school. Um, I think it's just being able to kind of establish a good foundation once you're at that level and, and go forward. That makes, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense. It's it's because it's tough because it's not a given that you're always going to jump level, so to speak there. Like you, you know, you had that successful transition middle school to high school and then high school to college. And then, okay, even if you didn't achieve your ultimate goal, still having success at the senior level, like that's not a given just because you do well in college does not mean you're going to be a good senior level wrestler. No, no, exactly. And it's, you know, no, it's true. It's, I see a lot of them. I'm looking at, I mean, just seeing some great ones in college and that didn't do much at senior. And, you know, I don't know. It's to me, it was a mindset because I was always focused on freestyle and becoming, you know, great. I think a lot of the individuals um, develop it throughout their college, which is great. But um, yeah, it's funny. I think a lot of individuals that I've coached in the past, motivation and exposure is one thing I could tell you when I got to Virginia tech, Ty walls, you know, he wouldn't mind me name dropping him. Ty walls was going to be done with college and going to get into real estate. And I think it was real estate property management or something he was in with real estate. That was like the next step for him. Yeah. Jared hot kind of the same way. Like, you know, the graduate, he's an engineer. He was a stud and um, didn't even think now, now walls is on the senior level. It was, it was just over, you know, course of being together. And um, I'm not going to take all credit, I, but I just, just exposure and different mindset on who he is and what he's going to do and what he's about. And, and now he's, you know, continuing to wrestle and having a, you know, enjoying it, I'm sure. And then he's in coaching. He's not in real estate. Maybe he's, Bought some houses. I know I got married, so she's probably, you know, <laughs> I won't make a joke. She's awesome. <laughs> no, they, uh, it, but like I said, it's, I, well, my point of all that was um, the mind is, is, as a coach, you're exposing these individuals to, to things that, or you're motivating. There's kids in the college level that just need a different, perspective from another coach or something that really motivates them and drive. It's funny because it's so powerful. Like some guys can take care of this part of it. And some guys like I worked with um, Derek when we brought Derek to Virginia tech and Derek St. John, we worked really well. And um, Derek can do things with athletes. I can't. And it was a good balance and I could do things like, and we both were, I would say, pretty good at knowing, like, hey, sometimes you'd say, hey, maybe not right now, <laughs> which I liked it. You know, I liked that he could know that about me. And then it was a good balance of how you're impacting and how you're developing and how you're working with an individual. And it's it's funny because it's – if you're invested, you see it and you know it. And you, you, I love the mind on how how an individual will receive it. And how what it will do for them moving forward, so it's it's important, but it's yeah. definitely interesting. So it's, yeah, just, so go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, just thinking about um, that you said you, you and Saint John that you guys were able to complement each other, right? I would I would think that's real important for coaching staffs to have coaches who do complement one another, not all the same. Yeah, no, it was good for uh, you know for him and I and all that. I mean, it was for me. I can say that, but. Um, there's days I, you know, I want, I, I couldn't believe it. And I want to flip up my lid and, you know, I'd be going in and I'm like, you know, flames must've been coming out my ears, even though I didn't even say a word. And he'd grab me by the elbow, say something like, Hey, you really maybe need to take a deep breath. <laughs> I loved it about him because I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, like, and he'd be like, and he was right, you know, so that was a good thing. 
and as a coach, you got to be able to realize that too. Like, um, like you said, the complimenting part is you, you learn from each individual that what they need. And especially when you have a great coaching staff, you can utilize this guy and his strength with this individual and this guy with his strength and this individual. And then maybe you come together and both take team and individual as far as like what they need, development, mind, technique, lifting, academics, all that kind of stuff. So, but it's all under like a certain canopy of, you know, mindset and focus. So yeah, it is, it's important. All that is with, with individuals. How about energy? What did you do and what did you see worked for athletes managing their energy throughout a long tournament? NCAA is three days. A lot of time in your mind. <laughs> yeah, what it is. The athlete be telling themselves, should they be watching a lot of wrestling? Should they be getting away from the arena? What do you recommend? You know, I had a lot of experience. You know, me, I, where I, I struggled. You know, I, I would get into tournaments and stuff and I, I would feed right in the tournament and just emotionally be like, <clears throat> and crash and stuff. So I was really sensitive on how to, how to uh, kind of preserve that for my individuals that when I was coaching and a lot of them that stemmed back from throughout the year, you know, I always told my athletes um, and a lot of them will laugh, but I, you know, building them up throughout the year and a lot of them like to be, just a bunch of savages, right? And you not all the time, but when you step on the mat, you want to be a sav you're a savage. It's that time. And um, I used to tell them, they're, you guys are like, you're caged lions. I'm going to keep you all in cages. And I said, when we get to this dual meet or when we get to the tournament, you know, we're going to throw rocks at you and I'm going to poke you with sticks. I'm going to get you all fired up and then I'm going to open the cage and you go out. And then the minute you're done, you're going right back in. And I want you still foaming at the mouth. And so that kind of, let me hang this phone up. I got a landline. That's good. Hey, I'll call you back. I got, um, I'm on a, a call on the, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> 82-year-old neighbor friend in Iowa and then I got a 92 year old they call all the time <laughs> in. Nice. But no so um yeah big tournaments like that uh, rest relax don't be don't don't want to be too much involved with it but um a lot of our guys you know we would uh they'd wrestle some of them individually wanted to sit around for a little bit and watch and that's not a big deal but usually you filter them back put them up have them focused on themselves, All, um, the nutrition side of it, um, clear mind, relax, rest, and just the next thing. Just worrying about coming out no matter what, who it is, and you're out of the cage. You don't know what's in front of you, but you're going to tear it up. And then at the end of that, you're going back in the cage, and you're going to go back and settle back down. And So it's just kind of that kind of mentality and that process throughout the big tournaments and and by that time, the, the training and all that's already done. So it's like a prize horse or anything. You just comb them and brush them and light exercise them, and then they know it's time to run. Yeah. And then what do you, what do you tell them that maybe some of them are too nice out there on the mat? We see this a lot in high school, but even, even in college where they're, they're thinking about they're feeling the other guy out as opposed to imposing their will right away or maybe – you know, they don't want, I, mean, I guess the younger age is more, you know, they don't want to hurt them. They don't want to look like they're overbearing. Like, how do you, how do you turn that off? Like, what are some of the things you would tell yourself to be able to flip that switch? So you go into that beast mode and have that killer instinct. Yeah, I guess it was just like, um, you know, for high school level, I'd see that more. I don't know. If, I mean, I guess there's kids in college are soft and just not soft, but just more of a, strategist and technical and like uh i think it's just um the motivation behind having your hand raised and um your competitive spirit of 
how and what's going to make put you in the best position for that to happen. And that's going to be output and output and smart wrestling. So how do we get there? Well, at that point, you've already practiced it through hours and hours and morning and running. I mean, and whoever that is out there essentially has put you through that. So you're doing this for this moment. So where you're good is certain individual, your, your wrist control, your wrist to that sweep. When that whistle blows, you're moving there, you're angling in, you're getting to that wrist. You know, it's not this big, huge, you're going to just be a blah, but you're going to get your wrist. The little thing, a little detail that they'll focus on. And that way that opens up that avenue of his great wrestling and his technique take over, you know, just. So a, get my tie up. That's what we're thinking. You're stepping on that, the line. Yeah. Tie. Whatever that is. Yeah. Get to that. Or you're moving this way. Mr. You know, I'm not going to stand there. When that whistle blows, let's get to that wrist. And then everything else kind of takes off. That makes so, sense. You know. It's usually the start that, that holds people back the most. And, yeah. And now talk about also after matches. I remember seeing video of you doing different workouts after matches, whether it be sprints or high knees, um, stance in motion. What were some of the things you did? And how did that give you both a physical and a mental edge after your matches? It was just, you know, a lot of kids, high school and college, they struggle from wanting to, I mean, you're afraid to get tired. I mean, that's what it is. That's why you just, that first question was like that tentativeness and feel yeah. a lot of it's just reserving energy, reserving energy. I don't want to get tired. I want to, you know, it's a, it would be a horrible feeling. And I think the things I was doing, I was energized. I was amped up and I knew I could push a little bit more. So I just, I wanted to make sure my feet would move really fast later. And as a coach, it's one thing I would always tell with our athletes too. The same thing is like when we're doing stance of motion at the end of practice and six months from now, it's going to look as fast as your stance of motion does at the beginning of practice. You know, it's being able to be conditioned and uphold the speed explosiveness and, um, in order to do that, you got to get, you got to get to the exhaustion state and then you got to push back barriers from there. And it's, you can just go work out and exercise. And that's one thing, but go, go do that whole thing that your exercise or your workout. But then when you're done, go do it again or do. And then some type mentality, you know, and then some is a coach at camp years ago used to say this story and I don't know it in detail. So I'm going to sabotage it. But what I do know is it was, it was about a gold miner, and it was a true story. He said, and I actually called him a while back on it. But it was a gold miner, and he's like, "Just remember these three words, and then some." And it always was like, "Okay." And I was like seven years old when I heard this, and it was about whatever you do, and then some. Well, this gold miner, he dug and he dug and he dug. He's married, family, and his wife over time thought he was crazy. Um, he wasn't getting to the gold and he literally was divorced over it, lost all his equipment. He was committed to this gold in California and down to his last shovel. And he sat on the property and everything was essentially taken. He ended up losing it to the bank, was sold an auction, the new People that came in, the, the mining company or whatever that bought the land, they dug six more inches and hit the largest gold strike in the history of the country. And that's how he always told the story. And he was always just talking about it and then some, and then some, just a, little, just a little bit more, just a little bit. And yes, he he told it a long version of, you know, argument, the fight with the wife, and he still just needed to do a little bit more and a little bit more. But he believed and he was passionate about it until. Not that great a story when you lose everything you got, but at the same time, it just tells you a little bit more about the unknown and what you don't know. Right. So being able to um, push just a little bit more. So that's where my thoughts when I got to the matches, I wanted to make sure my feet would move quicker. Um, 
So even when I was fresh, that helped me when I was fresh. Um, I could exert myself um, knowing that once I was exhausted, I could still, that was just a, that was a building the mind up, you know, was it more, was it more instinct training or, or like after the, after the wrestling match or was it, did you say like five minutes or 10 minutes or not really just kind of go on instinct? Just went. Yeah. A lot of times we would do bike sprints. That was from coaches and stuff. Get on the bike and you got, I don't know, 10 bike sprints, eight bike sprints where you're on 30, Yeah, you know, just get on there and you're exhausted on the mat, right? You get on aerodyne and then you knock out 30 second go, just as hard as you can. Keep it moving. 30 second go, boom, as hard as you can. Knock out 10, 12 of them, eight of them. But then maybe two more rope, rope climbs, three rope climbs, um, stance of motion, foot fires, curls, hammers, just where you're taxing the muscles and building that stamina up um, while your lungs are just working hard. That'd be after practice, you're saying? After practice or after a match, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, like, I, you know, I, I mean, my dad, our dad always said, you know, everybody's done with practice. You, you want to be the first one there and the last one to leave. And it's that same mentality, just whether, you know, when I got to college, I know my brother, I don't know the exact number, but he did 25 pull-ups every day after practice. And he always used to tell me, I, I, I knock out 25 or 100, whatever it is. But I figured we have this many days of practice. You know how many pull-ups I'm doing, making myself better by the end of the season? Just that kind of stuff. So you always want to invest more into yourself. And it's you can't go wrong. You're doing good things. So the more you put into it, the more you believe, whether you, you are or not, the more you believe, you're going to get out of it. So some it, it, it's funny because it's that's work stuff. I could tell you an example of, Guy like Eric Jurgens, couple time NCAA champion, great wrestler. That dude could walk into a gas station an hour before practice, get a microwave burrito and a snicker, and you couldn't tell him not to do it or say anything about it. He did it because he needed it for practice. And guess what? He walked into practice, he'd be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> it literally was this his frame of mind and what he now can everyone else do that? No. But that guy, he believed in what he was very, it was interesting because I was young, you know, I was freshman. He was, you're older than me, but I'm like, no way. No, I, you got to eat like certain products and nutrition, but him, he believed it and it worked. So yeah. there's a fine line with, you know, you talk about the beginning, maybe having this, this, uh, kind of a guideline to go by but it it can be tweaked by all your individuals some guys you know just work differently and react differently to certain things so you got to find what works for each individual yeah. why, why, you, why you talk about belief there last question because i could i love picking your brain about all this stuff this is all great um i remember seeing in the iowa documentary your parents holding the rosary beads going into the tournament was your faith Big growing up, was that an important part of, of your family life? Are you guys Maronite? Catholics. Ma yeah. We're, Ca uh, uh, Marin? Um, yes, we're. Um, my Is it the friend? Lebanese, the, Mar the Maronite? Well, yes, but my, uh, my Greek uncle, Greek Orthodox, he was a Greek Orthodox here. He's a Lebanese. And Lebanese, traditionally, you know, are Christian. A lot of yep. people don't know, like to think that. But what nationality are you guys, by the way? Italian. And Italian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Zanetti. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it. I remember a couple other guys from out east that were Lebanese that I'd met through college that I couldn't remember, but it was kind of small world. But, yeah. Yep. Yeah, because the, the only two the only two. What's that? Mom still. We're up in the mountains. She's across the river. Yeah. Um, she was sitting in her chair yesterday watching church on her iPad. Because we didn't have church. She, so she's Orthodox, not Maronite. Yeah, Orthodox. Oh, okay. Okay, because I was thinking, because Maronite is also in, in, in Lebanon, right? That's Lebanese? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but was that big growing up your faith to you guys? Very. 
We grew up in Catholic schools. Um, from kindergarten through seventh grade, I was. Yeah. My brother was through sixth grade at the time. My sisters. But yeah, my mom, um, my dad, whole family, we church on Sundays and Catholic school. I kind of got a little rambunctious as I got older, junior high, and moved out of the Catholic school. Mainly to wrestle in junior high because I didn't have it. But um, yeah, a huge, huge impact in our lives as far as um, family and morals and character. Um, that was my mom to a T and my dad to a T. My dad, he was intense and he he had a mouth on him like a truck driver, but um, he still had restraint and he had guidelines as far as mom. I've never heard my mom swear in my entire life. Never heard her one word. And it was, you know, I think the biggest part of all that being raised um, Christian is is the foundation of our family. It's the most important thing. I'm not married. Um, I can tell you what, though, if, if I was, it would be based completely around that because you, if you want to succeed, especially in today's world, with any marriage, especially with the percentage of that doesn't succeed, if you and your significant other can, you know, build around that it seems to me like my mom and dad and everyone in our family and close to us that that have succeeded in 30 40 50 year marriages um that's a big part of it that's that is the part of it and they'll have been married in june 57 years wow. and um yeah my sister that's in kansas sister terry her and her husband, they've been married uh, 88, what is that, 30 years, 32 years? Sounds so, right. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's all place. He was a farm boy from Kansas, raised Catholic, and, you know, it's, uh, it's important. I know that's the big reason in my recipes of um, coaching, um, what's kept me you know, grounded and motivated and and focused on athletes is because of that kind of upbringing. You know, Thanks. having faith, uh, believing, um, you're nervous before a match, read, yes. read Bible verse, Deuteronomy. I loved reading Deuteronomy. It was about um, just not having fear and stepping out there and you know, believing in what you've been doing. And there's just a lot of, a lot of things where you can have a unsaid power coming from you when you step out on the mat. So it's, it's pretty good. Not every kid you, you, um, will take with that, but and you don't want to push it, but you want to expose them all to it. And if they want to have that direction, I know as a coach at Virginia tech and at, uh, Ames, or wherever I was, we all had uh, Bible studies, and I think most programs do. But um, you see good things out of the individuals, good leadership, good qualities from those those individuals that follow. You know, absolutely priorities, self sacrifice that that all in that all in mindset that I'm that I'm doing it to the best of my ability. I'm holding myself to a standard, and not just to do it for the people who are watching me, right? That it really is a part of who you are. So that's, that's why I figured that must be a, that must be an important part of your family life because that those priorities are there. The work ethic is there. The values are there. The perspective, the big picture is there. It'd be almost impossible to have that without a rock solid foundation. But it's that's awesome true. stuff. Like that's awesome stuff. I think the biggest thing you take out of it too is, and I wish more people did is humble. It's just right. humble. I tell you what, it's, it's almost lost. <laughs> it's right. not completely. There's so many great examples. Like Kyle Snyder, I think is amazing. Um, a lot of individuals are, but at the same time, uh, B 
being able to go out and do great things or be in a power position or be having a title of whatever it is that maybe you think is really awesome. And it probably is, <laughs> but maybe being humble about it. You know what I mean? I think that's a, it's a hard to do for a lot of people, which is too bad. And I think, um, I think you can stick with that. If you read anything about the Bible and no, uh, have any following whatsoever, it's really easy to learn to be humble, <laughs> right? Which is important. No, it's fine to me, you know. No, just being able that because that that improves. First of all, it's the right thing to do. Second of all, you're more coachable. You're more trainable. Um, you're just a better person. More nicer to be around. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, the right thing to do. That's a big one. It's easy. It. I mean, you know what? I think it's easy for me around when you're put in positions, but the young kids and that growing up, you're, you know what? It's a, you have to develop that strength because we are drawn at every angle in the world to maybe not take that path. You know, we're, we're all that way. It's just the way it's our makeup, but same time it, it helps you keep in perspective of, you know, especially like I'm around my nephew and my niece or they were here this weekend. They're 10, 11 years old. And, you know, they're at that stage. Like the right thing to do is important right now. It's really is, you know, and, and that, that will not dictate your future, but it, it really sets you up being able to grasp that now. And then it'll always be there growing up. Cause there's always going to be things that, uh, you know, just remember at the end of the day, is this the right thing? You know, it's, it's always going to be a struggle, but being able to have that strong foundation about it's huge, huge for them, for that's everybody. Awesome. That's awesome. You know, you're right. That's a, that's, that's a great place to leave it. Thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate it. The original fanatic, the OG, Mike Zach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, man. <laughs> Take care, brother. Good chat with you. Yep, Absolutely. we'll see you. Bye.